So a very warm and official welcome again. Um, I'm Nina, Nina Wuss. I'm the chairwoman um, of AFCO. We are representing the venture capital and private equity space uh, here in Austria, um, trying to connect um, the existing players with uh, international partners, but also with the broader ecosystem. Um, we are doing this um, as quite a big group um, of members within our organization um, and also board members that are actively driving this. Um, I already see some of my fellow board members here in the call um, and I also uh, am with um, Anno Beas, our new CEO, who is uh, co-hosting this session with me today. Um, with uh, the deep dives, which we are hosting on a regular basis. We want to make sure that um, AFCO members get the opportunity to, on the one hand, share insights into what they're doing on a daily basis as fund managers and experts in their respective field, um, and thereby also give them the opportunity to connect to you, um, the audience, um, the ecosystem players that are interested in um, connecting in terms of learning, um, getting uh, interesting uh, intros regarding business, potential investments or co-investments, while also exchanging um, knowledge with other fund managers. Um, and in that capacity, we today have IST Cube, um, which is uh, one of our AFCO members and um, one of the very active deep tech funds here in Austria and also beyond the borders. And what we're looking in today specifically is the topic of uh, deep tech spin-offs and how to fund them, which is not always so easy um, and where IST Cube uh, definitely did a lot of groundwork um, and also pioneering work here, especially in the Austrian region. And um, Ingrid and Markus, our speakers today, um, will share um, some of their learnings um, with us today. As usual in the deep dive sessions, I encourage everyone to really ask um, all the questions that pop up um, while listening to the experts and then especially in the Q&A. So you can already drop your question in the chat function while Ingrid and Marcus are still speaking. And I will then make sure in the Q&A session that also your uh, question is covered. And obviously everything then that comes in the Q&A will uh, get heard um, and discussed as well. And uh, yeah, without any further ado, I'm asking um, Ingrid and Marcus to yeah, introduce themselves and uh, the topic that we're discussing today. Welcome and thanks for doing this with us. Well, perfect. Um, Nina, thank you very much for, for that very kind introduction. Um, Nina and Arno, and Arno obviously welcome in your still new role, not, not quite new, but, uh, but it, it, it's good to have you as well. And, and Nina, thanks very much for the initiative. Um, I just looked quickly at the list of attendants. It's, 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 a, it's a lot of well-known names, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it sounds like a family call a little bit. But there are some new people as well, and I really uh, appreciate to, uh, you know, to get to know new people who are actually interested in that field. So please don't don't hesitate to, to you know, ask questions and reach out to us. Um, maybe we should start with uh, introducing um, ourselves. Um, and let me just see if I get this right. Here you go, Ingrid. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ingrid, Ingrid Kelly. I was a molecular biologist in, in a first life, in my first career move. But very quickly, I realized that while I loved the science, I didn't want to necessarily be the one at the bench. And at that point in time, I made a career move into patent law and trained to become a European patent attorney, first in London and subsequently with Novartis in Switzerland in various functions. Um, and then life took us a little bit on a journey around Europe. We landed in Vienna 11 years ago, I think. Um, and at that point in time, I made another move, something related but also different, which was the world of technology transfer uh, initially at the University of Vienna. I learned a lot in that position, in particular about how universities function, about how technologies can make the move from academia into, into industry. Um, but I was really pleased to be asked to, in, to join the technology transfer team at IST Austria here initially, um, because I could see that things were happening out here in Klosterneuburg. 
Um, and on top of that, then to be able to join the IST Cube team and really work closely together with um, spin-offs from Austrian universities has been incredibly educational and fulfilling for me. Marcus. Um, so my own background is, 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 is way less scientifically accomplished than, uh, than Ingrid's, but, but initially um, uh, my first job was with uh, Safeguard Scientific, US venture firm. Um, that was sort of my initiation into venture capital and then I, I moved on and jo joined the initial venture capital team of the European Investment Fund, which you know obviously everybody today knows as, a, as the major LP operation in Europe. At the time, we were four people and I think 500 million total LP commitment, which is, I think, today 20 billion or something. So these guys have moved on as well. I also moved on and then to MIT then from there um, and um, I had a pretty cool time, I have to say, in uh, in, in Boston. I, I did sort of a lot of guerrilla type undergrad work across different scientific disciplines. And that was for me, yeah, really interesting, and I, I got exposure to, to you know, molecular biology, but also uh, media lab and uh, and double E uh, subjects. And from that on, um, I had you know for about fifteen years or so investment and consulting roles. I was with PCG for quite a while, and then for QA, the the sovereign state fund um, in the Middle East. And we came back to Vienna in two thousand fourteen. And then I thought, you know, it would be really great to work actually with smaller companies um, again, rather than doing sort of uh, global stage M and A transactions, and um, and realized that the development of of the institute here, IST Austria, is at an exciting sort of uh, development uh, trajectory. Uh, it was really small at the time. Um, and now we have grown, obviously, um, but um, it was then that we started to build this whole sort of innovation ecosystem at, at IST Austria, and that was sort of my role for the last uh, six, seven years. So that's a bit of a longer intro, but then you know who you are talking to and sort of what our motivation and background is. Um, the plan that we have for this afternoon, uh, or the coming hour, is basically um, Three things. I mean, the first two are really an intro. Um, we, we try to keep it short, and uh, obviously, this is not a it's not a pitch for us. That's not the intention. But still, I think it's interesting to, to for you to see what our um, uh, conviction and proposition is. It is um, it is really interesting to learn a bit more about the institute here. I mean, this is a real stellar development in the Austrian scientific landscape that everybody must know about. And then we have, um, you know, just a, a few prompts for for discussion about our experiences and and also yours um, for just a, a mutual discussion, really. So on that note, um, let me just move on, and and really start with our our conviction slide and, and what are we, right? So so ISD Cube is a is a seed stage fund really targeted at scientific founders. Um, very early, we are the first guys to invest. Um, we have a fund uh, at the size that allows us to follow on through Series A, B. Um, we are closely linked to the Institute, something that we that you know is uh, makes us special, I think, and we'll elaborate on a bit uh, later. But not only the Institute, also the team that we have brought together, I think, is quite distinct, sort of from a classic venture capital um, investment team. Um, the Practical stages that we we raised our first fund uh, closed it last year at, at 45 million. I think we were lucky, and I mean fundraising right now is not the most complicated of exercises, as, as many know. Still, for that um, um, uh, vertical, maybe not, not that obvious, but we managed to attract a group of, of about 30 investors. And a really, I think, good and, and also sustainable mix of industry, uh, financial, and, and also public investors uh, and family offices. Um, we have 13 investments in the portfolio. Um, we can talk about each of those. Um, I think we will briefly touch upon the portfolio because obviously that gives us gives you a flavor of what it is that we're actually doing. So that's in a nutshell what we are. Um, our Thesis, if I can just continue with this, um, I think given what we're doing, it's pretty obvious what our thesis is, right? So we, we are really convinced that the, the scientific and technological potential, you know, here in Austria, in Central Europe, is, is vastly outpacing the, the investment capacity um, of the area. 
right? Um, I think this is this is meanwhile a no-brainer anyway, right? Um, that's more sort of from the geographic dimension and the, the, the development of the scientific versus um, the venture capital systems in these countries. From a macro perspective, I think it's also quite clear that the next innovation cycle that we are already totally currently in um, is, is really much more geared towards uh, science and deep tech investments, you know, within particular scientific fields, but, but most importantly, I think, at the convergence of fields, right? Um, computational material science, right? The computational drug discovery, um, uh, soft matter physics and drug delivery. Um, I mean, there are, there are so many examples of intersections where things are happening um, that we really believe this is the place to be. And that's a tricky place to be because you need to be, um, I think, geared up for that and you need to have a different skill set to be able to understand these different verticals and also the intersections. Um, compared to sort of the, you know, the, the, the VC investment paradigm for the, the last decade. That's in a nutshell what we believe in, uh, um, in a bit more detail, but also not too much. Um, you know, what evidence is there that, you know, Austria and, and neighboring countries are actually doing scientifically really well? Um, let's not dwell too long on this. It suffices to say that, you know, there's a lot of criticism typically, right? We don't have enough STEM graduates, um, um, you know, we are sort of mediocre at best compared to the, you know, Stanford's and MIT's of this world and so on. You know, some of that is true, some of that is not true. Um, I think um, if you look at, at science and engineering graduates, you know, the numbers are actually, if you actually look at the numbers, um, and you're quite attractive. Um, Austria in particular as a country, you know, continuously ranks, not top, I don't think we are number one anywhere, but we are always somewhere in the top five, six, seven, eight countries, right? And um, and obviously in the in terms of our venture capital market, we are certainly not top five, six, seven, <laughs> anywhere. Um, the, I just brought one one statistics, that's a nature study actually, that, that ranked Austria as, as one, you know, really interesting scientific challenge states um, with a particular um, exposure to, to chemistry, physical sciences, life sciences. I mean, there are strengths in the country, this is really, um, that's, that's undoubted. And one example of where you know, Austria is really leading the way is, is this new institution, a well, relatively new institution, um, ISD Austria. And, and Ingrid, maybe we, mm -hmm. you want to continue to run through that. Sure, yeah. So I think we're, we're certainly unique in Austria and fairly unique worldwide in having this very close relationship between the fund on the one hand and the leading academic institution on the other. So geographically, we're very close. We're across the road from each other. Um, but also really in practical terms, in terms of exchange between ourselves, our portfolio companies and the academics over the road and, and also in the reverse direction. So maybe just a few facts about, about IST itself. Um, this is now, I think, the 12th or 13th year of IST's existence. Um, we were very lucky to have recently heard that we secured funding for the Institute um, from the federal and local governments until 2036, so a really, you know, unique and secure setup. Um, we have a new president joining next year, um, a well-known molecular biologist, I'm happy about that, joining from the Salk Institute. Um, and the, the ISD has grown in ways that nobody could really have foreseen. So ways in terms of the kind of science that's done, and this has grown organically just based on the people who've applied to us. So we have particular strengths in areas like neuroscience, computer science, physics, and chemistry all over the road. Um, and many of those researchers are young. So these are young PhD students who are high flyers, who are achieving things, and hopefully, ultimately, some of them will be starting their own companies. And ISD tends to follow the example of the Weizmann Institute, which was an inspiration for ISD's foundation, meaning that technology transfer is taken seriously, so that spin-offs are an explicit wish and intention of, of IST Austria. Uh, again, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but um, really amazing things have happened since IST was founded. This was, uh, uh, these are tables from Nature, the journal, and we looked at so-called rising institutes, so new institutes who are 
moving up the ranks in terms of quality of research. As you can see, uh, worldwide in 2018, IOST was already, was already number, number eight. If you look and adjust for size, IST does even better. So on that basis, we were, IST Austria was number three already in 2019. Uh, another measure of success is the ERC grants. Uh, this is a, an, in, an indication of academic excellence. IST is one of the most successful institutes in the world. And, and of course, we have also many faculty who've had um, prizes, uh, Wittgenstein awards, et cetera. That's enough praise for us. Yeah, I guess. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sure many people already know. What's, what's practically made relevant, maybe, is apart from us exchanging directly with, with the scientists over the road, uh, we can offer our portfolio companies access to those facilities if available. Um, so, for instance, one of our portfolio companies is using um, preclinical mice models um, over the road, and are very pleased with the setup there. But we have a whole slew of different um, uh, facilities that can be accessed uh, for a fee, of course, by our companies, um, all you know, uh, modern, all really leading edge kind of facilities and, and staff um, who really know what they're doing. And I mentioned already that we ourselves are located over the road from IST Austria. So we're in IST Park, um, shown in blue on the map there on the slide. IST Park um, was uh, set up be between IST Austria and Land Leader Österreich. Um, the idea here is to house tech companies um, of, of all sorts, not necessarily linked to IST Austria, also not necessarily funded by IST Cube, but it does mean if space is available that the IST Cube portfolio companies are welcome to come and occupy office and lab space here with us. So much I think about the, the Institute, um, which is really the backbone of, um, of our development, but the people who are actually you know, working and, and um, doing the investment within ISD Cube um, are actually these guys. So, so by now we have a team of 10 people. Um, and, and I think what's really quite special about this is that, um, I mean, as Ingrid mentioned before, and as you also can see in, in, in her uh, career, really combine an understanding of how scientific institutions and the technology transfer function within these institution works. And this is obviously not trivial. And I think many institutions are really, not only in Austria, really across um, uh, the board, are struggling um, to get this right. And it is helpful uh, to avoid really an initial already antagonistic setting to just understand what the, uh, the restrictions and, and uh, settings um, of the different parties are. And I think this is what, what makes us um, different. What also makes us different is really the breadth of uh, scientific background. Um, just quickly on the team without going too much into detail, you know, you've met Ingrid and me. Um, Alex uh, is a chemist um, by training, uh, Bernard is a computer scientist by training, uh, Kavita a material scientist and physicist. Um, so we're really covering the main uh, scientific disciplines as well. But I think also in terms of attitude and character, right? So we have more sciencey type of people and we have also more transactional uh, oriented people. And I think this mix is something that, um, that for us works uh, really well. In terms of strategy, um, so okay. this is this is unsurprising, I guess. Um, I mean, we we invest early. We want to be the first guys to invest, uh, typically. So this, um, whatever you call it, but you know, when we call it pre-seed, um, it doesn't mean that we do any sort of pre, uh, you know, company foundation grant uh, CLA type of stuff. So we 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 make equity investments once the company is uh, is being founded. Um, in terms of stage, and we can talk much more about this in the discussion then, you know, initially, and this is what's peculiar, I think, about that, that domain, we are only talking tech de-risking, right? So this whole idea of you need to go to customer early and whatever, that in most cases, that doesn't work at all, I think, in that, in that domain. Um, so yes, uh, pre-seed, um, seed um, up to series A, B. Obviously, when you look at the different verticals and the different measures um, that, that are relevant, then they, they look very different, uh, obviously, in a, in a preclinical and uh, clinical setting. Um, but this is sort of roughly the stages that we look at. 
and in terms of um, of uh, uh, amounts, um, I mean these are averages and, and and not cast in stone. But I think what what works, you know, very well in Austria, and everybody on this call <laughs> knows this anyway, um, is is the complementarity between equity investments and the grant structure. You know, in the early phases, um, I think many countries didn't get that right. And there is some crowding out going on between, you know, non-dilutive funding and, and, and equity. That's perfect in Austria, I think, right? So in, in every AWS uh, pre-seed seed grant, um, you have equity milestones in, in every FFG basis program, you need uh, equity contributions. That's exactly how it should be set up, I think. And, and that also helps to, uh, you know, um, limit the initial equity exposure to to you know some some six digit figure um so typically for that the de de-risking phase and it depends a little bit obviously on what are we talking about exactly you don't need several millions um of initial investment i think that's um and that's a long discussion we've had internally because you can also say that you know a, a seed round in the us is five million so what are you playing around with a few hundred thousand but but I think this makes a lot of sense, but happy to discuss this further. Um, yeah, so, I mean, these are the sort of target ownership numbers we have in mind. Um, we are always very open about this. I mean, generally, we are very transparent. I mean, our, um, our term sheet is on our website. Uh, we really want to wanna help to also, you know, develop the, the market further in a way. Um, and I think there has been, you know, features of a not fully developed market. <laughs> Put it like this and during the last couple of years uh, and the lack of transparency i think is is one of that um notary publics is another one but that's that's beside the point um yes yeah, so so we can put up to you know three to four million uh, in an individual investment and that's sort of the logic on that slide um we looked at by now way more than 700 deals so so there is deal flow um i mean not you know it, it's not thousands right um, but it's definitely enough for I think a fund of our size most of the stuff that we've looked at so far is Austria and it's a really um, you know third 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 roughly mix um, uh, between life science although I have to say that the, the quality of deals I think tends to be better in that um, uh, vertical and and that he and, and materials and physics um, one of the features I think of us is that we are really um, very friendly. We 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 are syndicating pretty much everything that we are doing. Um, we uh, for what we are doing, I think our fund size is big enough. But we you know we are not managing hundreds of millions and and have a pressure to deploy. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, we understand that you know it takes really a broad investor base to carry the ideas that we are backing through. And I think this is structured well in a combination of, of a, a syndicate as a starting investor group. And then obviously as, as the development progresses and the, the state of the company progresses, bring in you know, more international, more focused and so on, um, other investors. Um, shall we have a glimpse at our portfolio quickly? Um, so the first investment we did, um, and I will not spend too much time on each individual one, so I'm for sure not gonna do them justice. Um, context flow. Uh, context flow is out of the Medical University of Vienna and TU Vienna, and a really cool team um, that basically started out with the visual search algorithms and, and sort of the data set from the Medical University uh, to, do re to, to you know, apply how, um, how radiologists deal with complicated problems. Um, and obviously this whole um, uh, domain is, is quite crowded, right? I mean, AI and, and medical imaging, you have probably 100 companies worldwide um, active. Their particular angle and their, their particular starting point and, and sort of medical university data set, I think is what made that compelling. Um, they have developed nicely. They did a Series A last year. Um, the BNC investment people from Simple came in, um, and I think they are developing quite nicely. Um, Prewave is out of the T of Vienna. I mean, most people on the call will know these companies anyway. But um, Prewave is cool. Um, founded originally by, by Lisa and a, a sort of a 
TU student who spent the time in Indonesia and, and, and thought that, uh, you know, um, native language uh, social media feed is something that is really interesting to feed into global supply chain intelligence. And this is exactly what they're doing. Um, stuff like Lieferketten Gesetz obviously has come to pass for them as well. So I think they are developing quite nicely. They, they clearly got uh, industry traction now um, and, and uh, are geared up to fulfill uh, Series A metrics. And I'm sure they are going to be doing a, um, a decent Series A uh, this year, actually. Anybody's interested, let us know. Um, Vitra Lab is out of the Univin Photonics Group. Um, <coughs> Uh, and obviously, you know, within uh, the academic landscape, there are individual pockets of excellence, and there's obviously our institute, but there, there are many others as well. And, and clearly, you know, the quantum activities uh, around Anton Zeilinger and sort of the resulting photonics uh, activities also um, are clearly, you know, uh, globally relevant. Um, that's a group that has basically commercialized the technology around micro waveguides um, that allows to really deploy photons, uh, you know, specifically and use them for visualization. And that can be used for screens. It can be used for uh, AI um, glasses. Um, yeah, also very exciting uh, development. Um, something we started also together with the Apex uh, colleagues. Um, Evan Hauser joined us then uh, last year and uh, also up for a, for a series A round this year. Uh, Ribbon Biolabs, it's also a pretty cool thing, um, that's sy synthetic DNA. Um, so the uh, uh, reading DNA, uh, obviously, and sequencing is something that has been, you know, a, a very remarkable and, and defining development in, in molecular biology through the last, you know, two decades. Uh, synthesizing and building DNA molecules is, is pretty much at the starting point, particularly when it comes to long strains. Um, that has the potential to really revolutionize many processes beyond the current research applications. Um, Ribbon has a pretty cool um, algorithm and logic how to automatically produce long strains. Um, they started out here, they're actually based here at, uh, at the tech park. Um, we just finished um, and closed the uh, I think 18 million Series A uh, round uh, last month. It's something that uh, our colleagues at TechNet um, uh, and, and us uh, backed initially, and also quite exciting development. But I think on that note, I guess I hand over to you now. Sure. <laughs> okay. So Valanx is another company that's uh, located here with us at IST Park. Um, based on technology that came out of the Teu graphs initially. And the idea here is to um, synthesize novel amino acids, which are then incorporated into proteins. And those proteins can then be used to make clever um, therapeutics and other molecules, which can be used um, in, a, in conjunction with, with uh, modern biopharmaceuticals, let's say. Um, TechNet, for instance, is a, was a co-investor with us. Um, they're making nice progress there, and I guess we're looking forward to the next funding round with them. Um, GST Antivirals is a medical university of Vienna spin-off, and they were into antivirals before anybody was really concerned about antivirals. Um, but their focus has been on rhinovirus, which is one of the causative agents of common cold. And they have a simple molecule which interrupts the replication of virus within the host cell um, and seems to be, it's proving to be pretty effective in, in animal models and in cellular models of the common cold. Um, and we're very excited that they've just started the first uh, recruitment for clinical trials. Um, they're growing well. They have, they have uh, various um, communication channels with some pharma companies. Um, I'm very excited to see what happens next, of course. Coming on to Sarkura, also staying in the kind of biopharma space, um, but with a kind of completely different approach. Um, most of you are probably aware of cell therapies like, like CAR T therapies and the challenges of, of um, generating therapeutics from a patient's own cells. This kind of has to be done really locally, you know, in the hospital where you're treating the patient. 
Um, Sakura is developing new solutions which combine you know, cell biology, microfluidics and electronics in an elegant way. And they're collaborating with the uh, IMEC, a um, leading research institution in Belgium to do so. Moving on. Um, my mind is something a little bit different. This is a little bit more in the region of, of med tech and, and digital health. Christoph Goetz is the founder. Um, his daughter was diagnosed with autism and he realized that therapeutic options were few and far between and, and, and very expensive too. So he set about developing a wearable EEG headset, which can be combined with a special software, a special training game, which can be used to um, in a home setting for neurofeedback, which helps to address a lot of the, the symptoms surrounding um, autism in severe cases. Um, they've made incredible progress in getting this device developed. And in fact, the European medical device approval is expected in May. So the next phase will be sales. Um, this will be a, an interesting phase for us to accompany. Um, of course, if anybody out there is interested in participating and knows someone who's affected, then please do reach out. Stonegate, we're proud of in part because it's a spin out of IST Austria together with, with SEM, the Center of Molecular Medicine. A number of professors um, got together um, in the context of consortium working on these um, so-called solute carriers. And these are very important transporters in the cell, cell membrane, which have been very difficult to target with drugs in the past. But through use of a, of a clever platform, um, this barrier has basically been removed. Um, and now many diseases in the area of neurology and cancer and so on can be addressed. Um, it's a drug discovery company. Um, it's early stages yet, but there's intense interest in the field, especially in this uh, area of protein degradation for both types. Butanos, this is a, a, an export from Germany. Um, <laughs> we were lucky enough um, that uh, Christoph Rademacher moved from the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces to join the faculty of the University of Vienna and doing so and decided that it would be appropriate to start the company around his technology in Vienna. The technology concerns a way of targeting therapies to a special set of cells of the immune system which are located in the skin called Langerhans cells. And this technology can theoretically be applied to things like mRNA vaccines to make them more effective and cheaper. Um, but could also be harnessed in the context of autoimmune diseases. So there are a number of evaluations going on with the pharma companies in that context too. Um, we jointly invested with a couple of people, including the, the high-tech Gründerfonds in Germany and CAM, who is also very present on the Austrian scene, and many of you know. Not, not many more to go now, but Eurolentech is another one in the area of autism, this time um, exclusively a spin-out of IST Austria from the lab of Gaia Novarino. Knowledge of the genetics of autism, which is a heterogeneous condition, um, should lead ultimately to being able to stratify patients into different types of disorder. And to do that, and to generate suitable cellular models for drug discovery, the team are creating a, a, a library of patient-specific models derived from patient material leading to differentiated neuronal cells that can be analyzed in vitro and then generate information that can be useful for drug discovery. Bear with us two months ago, um, but I'll make it quick. Um, Selectric, so there are two more recent ones. Selectric, we just did, I think, uh, two months ago or something. Um, that's a pretty exciting team that has worked for quite a while um, on electrodynamical processes, electroporation. Uh, with you know, a set of different applications. Um, an initial application of the technologies is the rapid diagnosis of sepsis. Um, and that's obviously a clinically relevant uh, topic. Um, and that's you know, um, what, what we are targeting to address as a, as a first indication, um, but it's still early days. Uh, as I said, investment is a few weeks old. And the same is true for, for Knista which is a TU Vienna spin-off. Um, it's uh, also a new team there um, on, on data analytics. Um, 
and basically it just finishes the then the entire scope that we have now seen and started sort of with uh, pre-wave and, and software companies and also the most recent one with Knista is one. Um, I think that we're now 13 companies, so thanks for bearing with us, but uh, we thought it's helpful actually to give you a flavor of what it actually is that we're doing. Um, and on this, I would move on and also the timing I think is perfect for that. Um, so a little bit of, of input for, for discussion with uh, with everybody. Um, I mean, what do we see? What's what's special? And that's sort of not only our uh, our knowledge, but but what does research derived um, you know spin off models and and ideas actually mean? Right, and there are many implications. But uh, one implication clearly is that we are talking about institutional and university IP ownership, and that's that would could be the subject for entire you know separate discussion and talk. Um, but many complications in the in the founding process still um, are based on the on the nature that um, you know the owners of IP are typically not the people who are actually going into the company and uh, and are starting that. Um, these people are typically researchers, and and the whole um, team development question is also you know a, a rich subject of of discussion. Um, there are different concepts around also internationally in trying to, to match people with ideas, uh, finding early CEOs. I mean, honestly, our, um, our experience so far has been that particularly in this early tech de-risking uh, phase, uh, that depending on what the technology is and, and the status, this could be a year, it could be longer. Um, you know, you need people in a driver's seat position. So as a CEO of the company, typically, who are really very familiar with the technical uh, basics, right, um, uh, of that idea. So the idea to bring in sort of an external CEO too early, um, yeah, it, it's something that's, that's debatable, but in most of our companies and the companies we have back, um, it is actually, you know, the postdocs who, who actually have been working on the stuff who are the initial managing director of the company. Um, yeah, I think tech risk and the ability of investors to bear tech risk, um, that's one of the, uh, in, in our view, defining characteristics of that entire segment. Um, and that has to do with, um, well, with many elements. It has to do with structural elements of the, of the fund or the entity that you're, you're investing from. Um, I think that needs to fulfill certain characteristics. It has to do with the skill set and, uh, and background of the people who take investment decisions. Um, it has to do with the patience of the underlying uh, LPs and investors, obviously. Um, so, so, yeah, there are, I think, many elements uh, clearly to discuss as well. Um, different to, to, you know, classic startups, if you, if you want to, to put it like this, um, is, is the you know really um, important criteria to to have a globally relevant IP protection, right? Uh, I mean, very often these are not sort of first come uh, first serve. Whoever is quicker actually gets it. Um, but you need to develop a basis that is uh, an IP basis that is a sound basis for for licensing partnerships with other large corporates, right? I mean, the companies that we are backing are not the guys who are actually bringing a product in the market typically, right? I mean, this will all be partnered. And for these partnership discussions, uh, the IP basis is, is absolutely critical. Um, you know, very different from a company who, you know, can do it alone and, you know, become a global player um, and, and speed is all that, that matters. Um, Still, competition is truly global, and there's an interesting parallel um, between the scientific world, which is entirely global, um, and, and that investment segment, right? In the scientific uh, uh, realm, what matters is who is the first person to publish something, right? And it doesn't matter if that person is sitting in Korea or in Japan or in Cooking or in, you know, wherever. Um, the same is true in the world of IP, right? I mean, the, obviously the first uh, to, uh, to invent something is, is what matters. Um, so I think having a global perspective is really important. Um, 
and also in the domain of recruitment. And that's a particular issue. Also, I think one that, you know, Nina is obviously and everybody is very aware of the issue here in Austria um, about, uh, you know, the, the bureaucratic um, impediments to bringing global talent, but, um, but that's you know, a major element. Um, and um, yeah, and last but not least, I mean, people need to buy into longer development um, times. I mean, this is this is clear. If people come, but I don't have to tell you, I guess. Um, if people come from a world of you know we invest today and you know in next year we do a big Series A and then in three years you know we have a 300 million whatever uh, exit discussion that doesn't work in that domain, not yet at least. Um, yeah, so these are just a few, you know, uh, foods for um, or pieces for discussion. Um, I think we would like to leave it at this, um, I think at least, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, are open to any, any reactions and any, any questions you might have. Wonderful. Thanks to the two of you for um, this huge amount of input that you gave. I think there's actually plenty of discussion points that come from this. Um, and I already see uh, my colleague Anno with the first question and encourage everyone who is in the room uh, to follow up with his or her input uh, on the topic. Anno, over to you. Thanks, Nina. Um, thank you very much, Marcus and Ingrid, for the presentation. It's, um, it's a very inter interesting topic and um, probably not so well known, so you ha really have a, a speciality there. Um, I was wondering, uh, going through the, the, the presentation, um, you, you were talking about the, um, um, the different stage, uh, stages of, um, of, in, of development of a, of a project, and um, you said you'd like to be the first guy investing in a project. Do you also sometimes consider um, entering in a project at a slightly later stage? Does it make sense for you? And um, ancillary question to that, what is the horizon for you for the idea of project? How long do you want to stay in the project? And if you want a third question, <laughs> um, I'm interested to know what's the ideal um, exit for you is uh, so, or, or, or let's say the, the, the ideal evolution of a project exit with a big industrial or um, a sort of scale up and um, own industrial stage. Yeah, sorry for the many questions. No, that's fine. I mean, let me start with the first one sort of point of entry. Um, look, I think. In, a, in an ideal and developed market, you have specialized players that have specific capabilities to bear risk commensurate with the, the type and, and time they enter a particular project, right? Um, I think our sweet spot really is, is at the intersection um, you know, of science and investment and, and in this very early phase. I think we really, you know, we, we read nature papers and we, we, I think most of those we actually understand um, and, and can really make a determination on, on, you know, what's real. I mean, what data would you show if you had it and, you know, why don't you have it? And, and these type of questions, right, that typically investors are not asking. So I think for us, it makes a lot of sense to be there early, right? Um, in addition, um, but this is also not new to anybody on the on the call. I mean, there are a lot of mistakes that can happen very early and are still happening in Austria, right? And uh, um, that can be avoided by, by bringing in somebody who looks at a, you know, traditional cap table um, uh, setting and just make sure that this thing is set up in a way that, you know, when an, when an international VC then is looking at that, it's not just, you know, raising eyebrows. So for us, that makes a lot of sense to be, to be there early. The horizon, um, well, uh, the fund has a, has a longer uh, lifetime sort of than, than, than typical funds. Um, we, are, we, we are still, um, you know, set up to invest up to a series B, um, I would say. How that translates to, into a number of years, that totally varies by, by vertical, right? I mean, we, we uh, are convinced that we will have investments that we hold on to, you know, seven, eight, nine years. Um, there will be investments that are uh, that are shorter because it has to do with your third question, which is the the exit route. Um, I mean, 
you know, on a very superficial level, obviously the the exit is 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 M and A to to other corporate uh, um, uh, partners. It 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 depends, right? Um, I mean, most of our portfolio currently is uh, is biotech. I mean, the the classic um, you know uh, drug development uh, route in biotech is is to partner. Um, at a product level and not necessarily at the corporate level. Um, and then at some point, then that can obviously uh, lead into an acquisition. That's different in other verticals, but it is always that, that main route, clearly. Maybe I can just add, I'm going to move my, my chair right over here. Um, to your point about the stage at which we invest, I mean, I think, you know, our sweet spot relates in a way to our backgrounds, to our experience and a key thing is is the trust element um most of the founders we're talking to have never spoken to a vc before perhaps they've spoken to an angel but likely not either and i think we we play an important role in building that trust we understand where they're coming from usually um we've seen a lot of the issues that they're grappling with at that time which may be in some part related to their process of breaking away from their university and organizing tech transfer and so on. Um, so in, in a way, we're kind of setting the seed for future rounds and for future investors because we're, we hope, starting things on, on, on a good footing in a very constructive and usually quite a friendly relationship, which um, I think is only possible when you're really at the same level and really can talk, you know, talk their language and, and explain things in a clear way. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions in the audience? So I see that Rudolf has uh, given a thumb up, even as an as a, he liked the input or he wants to uh, add a question. So please, Rudolf. Right. Just push the wrong button. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the topics that you raised yourself uh, is that you, you, um, uh, the fact that you are backing uh, mostly researchers who are founders and and uh, you know spin-offs of from university. You know, they, they don't necessarily come with the experience of um, management or managing, uh, uh, you know, a company or or, or a build-up of a company. <clears throat> So, how do you deal with the um, with the issue of complementing the team uh, with um, just um, management types um, who who have a commercial background and who can um, help the team uh, to set the right steps towards um, uh, market entry and and eventually scaling uh, scaling the company? It's definitely a challenge and. Most of the teams, as you say, are really composed purely of scientists at the beginning who've never had any role in business of any sort. And we're sort of seeing two developments. One, I would say, is the case where a pure scientist personally develops rapidly in the course of this journey to the point where they really can be, for instance, in a very effective CEO in a, in a scaling growth phase biotech. Um, and so we do what we can to sort of support them to develop those skills and provide, you know, fill whatever gaps that they have. On the other hand, we have people who take over the role kind of under duress. That's not really what they want to do. They're prepared to do it ad interim, but their ultimate aim is to bring in someone from outside when the company's big enough. And for those people, it's really a case of um, complementing what they can't do with skills brought in either from our team or by bringing in advisors from outside. Regardless of which way it goes, clearly the team needs to be built up. And if you have a strong CEO, you're still going to need all of those other functions at a high level um, to, to enable the team to grow effectively. Um, individually and at that level, I, I would say that our companies do manage eventually. It's not always straightforward. It doesn't always work the first time round, but it seems to get easier and easier in, in a way that's logical. And you, as you show that you've made progress, that you have the first successes, clearly people are more and more likely to want to come on board. It's like a domino thing. If you get one person on the team who you've managed to bring in from industry, more will join. But I mean, I mean Marcus may have maybe wish to add to this, but 
the feeling is that somehow this pool of candidates tends to be selected from Austria. Not a bad thing per se, it's just a smaller pool. And I, I think, as, as again, Marcus referred to, this should be something global. We should be looking at recruiting in people who are interested in joining a startup from the whole European scene and maybe even beyond. For me, this this whole uh, people development topic is is totally fascinating, right? So we are looking, as as Ingrid said, at a at a postdoc, right, who has been in a position where typically you know closely supervised, uh, contributing to, not to say it's being at the whim of of, of a PI, um, and now in a in a management role, and and seeing these guys develop is brilliant. Um, if I think about uh, yeah, I don't know, just to name a few, and it's, it doesn't say anything about the others, but uh, but Markus Holzer, the CEO of, of Context Explore, right? Ariel, who is running Soulgate, or Harold, who is running Ribbon. I mean, these guys have, have made a, a remarkable personal development within, you know, one, two, three years. And that's really nice to see, I have to say. And uh, so so on this question, which is, which is often asked, right? So do you impose, uh, you know, an... Uh, third party or a new CEO, uh, how do you deal with this transition? You know, we are really convinced that we, and we, and we think that the person has, you know, you know, from the beginning, the potential to give them the chance to actually run this and carry it through. And so far, I mean, still the final tour is still out clearly, um, but this has been quite successful. Thank you for that. Um, I see that Anno has raised his hand and also I think Marcus gave also a thumbs up which might indicate another question. So I would ask Anno first and Marcus if you have a question to follow up straight after Anno. Um, Marcus Ingrid, I have a more peripheral question about, about the Austrian market. So you're probably sitting in one of the best observation desk deck about innovation, uh, technology and uh, creation development. Um, and 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 also a university. So um, so really forward thinking. Um, do you see in Austria the possibility that um, some innovation clusters um, 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 would emerge, um, would, would 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 be created, and would you play a role into that? Um, Austria has a. Also, like Germany, I should say, um, a tradition of uh, close collaboration between academia and, and industry, local industry. Right. So, when, when you look at how FFG has structured their major funding and grant um, activities, this, you know, for decades has been geared towards um, making sure that there are collaborative platforms. So Austria is the country of clusters, right? I don't even know how many hundred clusters we have on something, um, which, you know, which per se is obviously a good thing, right? Um, and this whole ivory tower type of discussion, I think in Austria is, is you know, in, in many parts misplaced because there is a very close in, uh, interaction. The type of interaction that is happening, I think is, is set up to facilitate, you know, immediate um, issues and problems that industry has on you know on a on a level where you know the r d heads uh, or r d you know division people uh, in, work with academia and these tend to be you know uh, incremental i mean important clearly uh, but incremental improvements to existing products it's not the type of innovation activity that is going to, you know, land us in the next century, and and also not going to be the basis of entirely new solutions and products. That's, I think, the important difference when you talk about clusters. I think what we need more is the second type of cluster. We need activities that can be centered around, you know, really globally leading research with the potential to come up with totally new stuff, right? Um, and in that second dimension. You know, we are not that rich, I would say. Um, Austria is a small country. Um, if the if then the numbers get small, you know, you immediately go from a systemic and structural level to a personal level very often. Um, personal relationships, positive and negative, always play a role. Um, and, and that's, 
actually a very important role, right? Um, and and that's also in sometimes facilitating, sometimes impeding, I think, the development. Uh, just a practical example, I think, in the life science domain, Austria has reached a, a size in terms of number of institutions, uh, of uh, people involved, that, you know, the sort of personal characteristics play less of a role, I think. I mean, this is definitely uh, a cluster, if you want, that is here to stay and, um, and flourish, um, I very much hope. I'm not sure if everybody will like this if I say it, but if you look at the, at the quantum realm, I mean, we have, you know, we have three centers of quantum development, uh, and I'm not sure how much talking is going on between them. Um, and uh, uh, so, so yeah, I think it depends on, on, on the different industries. And I think that, you know, there are, if you like, innovation clusters or, or expertise in particular scientific areas at a high level in Austria, in various domains, as you mentioned, quantum or microbiomics, these kinds of things. So really, I think what's missing is capturing that um, and delivering on the translation of that innovation. It will be published, you know, the scientists are good scientists, but actually making that into something tangible that becomes commercial and and actually then delivers something to society. I mean that that's the missing step. And I'm surprised again and again by you know when we do outreach activities where we go and talk to researchers, how many of them are kind of incubating an idea, but they don't know what to do with it. They're they're really stuck at that point, and our experience has been that they're so appreciative to have a chance just to brainstorm with us. Um, there's no, it's very very early stage at that point, but they, you can see their eyes get, get big because they start to see, gosh, oh yeah, I mean we could do that and we could do that. And I think a lot of what we do is not reflected in our portfolio because it's a catalysis event. Oh, very clear. Okay. This means you have um, you have um, a lot to do still in Austria. You have a, a good activity in front of you. That's for sure. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My, my question, following on to that, would be: if you look at the broader deep tech funding ecosystem, like also on a pan-European scale, um, the term deep tech is used nowadays by so many funds uh, being raised or already being active out there in the market. So it's obviously obviously also very broad in terms of the verticals that are then um, connected to the term deep tech. How do you feel about potential follow-on investors, so also co-investors um, outside of Austria that you are interested in working with? So are they, on the one hand, how many of them are out there? Are they already aware of the great things that are also happening within your portfolio um, and, and the broader ecosystem around you? And what's your um, take on the, on the state of deep tech uh, funding in Europe? Um, I mean, from a you know thirty thousand feet macro perspective, we are we in the total sweet spot, right? Uh, everybody wants to do deep tech investments. Huge funds are raised um, uh, by people who are then struggling to find projects. Um, we are developing projects and we have projects. So, so you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, we are exactly at the place where we should be. Um, I think. Specifically, um, I mean, the, the whole uh, VC world is still a very much relationship driven type of business. Um, that's also not a surprise to that group. Um, but for that, and, and that's, um, that has pluses, obviously. Um, and we, we live from our networks. And it's, you know, if you know somebody and you give them a call, then, you know, uh, investment analysis and due diligence activities might be reduced to a very short time frame. <laughs> Um, but it's also not ideal, right? Because still, the, particularly for new people and new teams, I mean, the development takes time, right? You need to form relationships that needs to be re repeat transactions really until trust can build. And so, so this is a slow process. Um, still accelerated, obviously, by the huge influx of money into, into the vertical right now. Um, but to, re to build really trustful relationships, that takes time. Um, 
But for us, that's fine because we have, I think we have built a structure um, that is really sustainable over a long time period. Um, also just because of the, the development trajectories for the underlying you know, companies takes longer. Uh, so I think funds and structures generally need to be set up to deal, you know, in a, you know, in a decade perspective and, and, and not a few years. Um, so we already have now just, uh, you know, back specifically to your, uh, to your question, I mean, we've done a few series A's now, I mean, all with international funds coming in. So yes, uh, you know, we are, we are starting to, to be visible, I think, and, and, and finding people. And, um, and this will definitely continue over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we play a very active role in, in helping our startups find those, those later investors, the Series A. They usually need a bit of a hand. And in the process of doing so, of course, we are telling people about what we do. And that usually sparks a further step of, well, we'd love to see what, what else is coming out. So there's definite interest in the Austrian system and what's coming out. In terms of awareness, it's limited, actually. I think, I think there's a lot of work to be done in raising awareness about all of the amazing things that are going on here actually okay thanks for sharing that yeah that uh, somehow fits my impression um i uh, had from basically talking to vcs in the neighboring countries yeah thank you um so uh, call to the out audience um what is missing? What uh, should we still discuss? Are there any open questions connected to um, the input that we have received now in the past 60 minutes? Don't be shy. Also feel free to unmute yourself if you want to do that. Um, otherwise, yes, Rudolf has another question. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it clearly, um, you are a good blueprint uh, for, um, you know, universities um, proactively um, supporting spin-offs. Um, how do you see that f for other universities in the country, uh, you know, particularly medical universities, and then, but also TUs? Um, where do you see the, do you see any preparedness to, um, to foster the, the um, other spin-offs and other, I mean, there's EQ Ventures who are doing that uh, also quite a, rather proactively as a, as, a, as a group of investors, but, but how about the preparedness of, of um, the, the university scene? Um, and Ingrid can definitely comment on this then as well. Let me just quickly say, I mean, we are insofar a, a special animal as as we are a mixture, right? So we are running and developing the tech transfer here at the Institute, but we are obviously also clearly running, running a fund that is investing in other places. So um, I would differentiate the answer to that question in these two dimensions. Um, so I, I don't think what we have done is sort of a blueprint for what everybody else should be doing. Um, it's also a very special feature of the structure and the flexibility that we have here at ISD. I mean, many universities, I think, couldn't do that. Also, I don't think Austria needs like 10 funds like ours, to be honest, right? Um, from a tech transfer perspective, um, I think the, um, the situation is that um, we have had a first phase, in, you know, once uh, the universities were legally in the position to, to, to deal with IP and, and have IP ownership of maybe a, a decade where, you know, not much has happened, I think, right? Universities struggle to implement uh, structures and processes, uh, hiring people and so on. So, so this is, I think, a decade that, uh, that Austria really slept. Um, over the last years, I mean, many places have become much more active, um, I think, and um, at, at many levels, and I mean, at the level of ministerial talk, I would say, and at the level on the ground of actually making things happen, um, the development has been left very much to the ambition of individual universities, so it has been very heterogeneous. Uh, I mean, some places, I think, have developed quite well, uh, and others are still struggling, so it is, it is very different, and I think the um, the most important thing that we are trying to, to convey and, and many universities are actually trying to do is, is just uh, speed and simplicity, um, right? I mean, the, 
the places where it works well, and we have actually done a pretty interesting international overview of these spin-off processes, um, it's standardized, right? In, in the places that turn out 10, 20, 25, whatever spin-offs a year, there is no individual license negotiation without end, right? Um, this is really where we have to get to, and um, this will probably take <laughs> in a few years, I mm -hmm. guess. And I think those those universities that are really among the best, in the sense, what they do is they they have a hands-on approach to their own startups. So they have people in the team at the university who know what it's like to start a company, who have a good knowledge about all of the different aspects, whether it's it's grants or, or the legal steps needed, that and an appreciation for what's involved in starting a company. And they can really give those startups a head start, which is not available in, in some tech transfer offices where the team is maybe very good at managing industry collaborations or maybe even out licensing IP, but they don't have any true appreciation for what, what it means to start a company. So perhaps that's something for the future to kind of build up that expertise a bit better within the universities to complement what's happening in you know, A plus B centers and so on. Thank you. Um, so I see that some people have to leave as we've already passed one hour. So also thanks to everyone who has been with us today. Um, I hope it was helpful. Um, are there any questions from the remaining audience that we still want to discuss? I think one or two additional questions are possible. Um, if there's something that you would like to raise right now, I mean, obviously also Marcus uh, and Ingrid are also available afterwards and are happy to connect. Um, and you will also receive the materials from today's session. So that's, um, the, that's also happening um, as a follow up. If you want to look up anything that has been discussed, um, this is going to be in your inbox. Okay, so I see no raised hands and no questions in the chat at the moment. Um, which for me would be the sign um, to say thank you. Um, thank you everyone for joining today, for spending the afternoon with us. Um, thank you to everyone who raised questions and contributed to the discussion. Um, I think it was once again very interesting also to take a closer look at what is happening in this vibrant ecosystem. Special thanks, of course, to Ingrid and Markus for sharing all um, the insights and the input today. And um, from uh, AFCO side, I can definitely say there are many things and events coming up this year, some of them already published on our website. So please feel free to get in touch with us anytime. On the one hand, if you have content ideas um, of what we should cover, um, if you want to collaborate with us as well, um, we are always open for that. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to hand back the mic to Markus uh, and Ingrid for their closing words. I'm not even sure we've got particular closing <laughs> <laughs> to say. Let me just say that um, we. I, I think it's it's really fair to say that we really enjoy what we are doing um, because you know it's not primarily uh, an investment activity, right? I mean, yes, we are managing a fund, we are managing money, and um, obviously, of course, role is also to professionalize, uh, you know, uh, venture capital as as a as a financial industry. Um, we are very aware of this, I think, but what really drives us, and I think this is really equally true for, for Ingrid and me and, and, and many other on our team, is really to see impact from scientific discovery, right? We are just coming out of a corona pandemic right now, and it's obvious, you know, what the role of, I mean, to many, it's obvious what the role of science is. And, and this clearly is the future, right? That being able to, to you know, dedicate, you know, our daily work hours to, to this topic is, is something that's, that's fascinating and, and I hope will be for, for many more years. I couldn't agree more. It's beautiful. So thanks very much. Whoever wants to reach out and, um, you know, thank you very much. This discuss whatever um, and you, I guess, all have our, our contact details or can find them. Uh, really don't hesitate. They are really um, you know, curious and, and eager to, to build this broader ecosystem, and that happens by, by talking. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great afternoon, everyone.